Hello everyone, I'm Zahid from Talks at Innovation Valley and today we have very amazing guest, Anil. Anil is the CEO of Cream Incorporation. It's not a right hailing company. Actually, it is K-R-E-E-M, Cream Incorporation. It's a consulting firm and Anil is the founder and CEO of uh, this company and basically Anil is the business optimization specialist helping business effectively execute their ideas for almost two decades and uh, uh, he is really passionate about the technology and what's going on and about the, uh, the innovations currently happening and the innovations that could happen in the future so first of all I really warm welcome you Anil. Uh, thank you Zahid uh, it's a pleasure to be here I appreciate the invite and I'm hoping for a, uh, a conversation where I can contribute today. You are welcome. So audience, today our topic is very, very exciting and amazing. The topic is challenges and opportunities, AI adoption in businesses. What challenges and opportunity, what are the challenges when you apply AI in the businesses and what are the opportunities? So, so I hope today's uh, conversation will go so good with Anil. So Anil, before we jump to the questions list, I would request you to share your life story, your career story, your professional story. I mean, when you started, uh, I mean, your professional career and even before that, from where you got your education and how you decided to, you know, become a consultant and, and launching your own company and how was all this journey from your school to university to this professional career to, be, to being an entrepreneur? Uh, well, I am. Um, so I was born in the Philippines to a entrepreneur in an entrepreneurial family. My my father had uh, a garments factory uh, that he ran out of um, uh, the Philippines, and so I grew up all over Asia. Uh, we started off in the Philippines. He moved over to Hong Kong, Indonesia, um, uh, looking for uh, places where production or manufacturing would be cheaper. Um, uh, after a certain age, I just decided that I wanted to kind of explore and go out and see the world by myself. Um, that, that took me further in my travels. Um, I, I lived in Europe for a bit. I lived in uh, New Jersey. Uh, I lived in, uh, in St. Martin, which is in the Caribbean Islands, uh, for, for a little bit. And then I got an offer to come to, uh, uh, to Africa. Uh, and as it was a continent I had never been to before, this is in the late 90s, I jumped on the opportunity, and that was my first time that I landed uh, on the shores of uh, of Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, back then, Nigeria was a very different uh, place, um, and uh, but I still saw potential in it. Even then, I my first job in Nigeria was in sales. I was involved in um, uh, selling automobiles and, and vehicles, uh, and I graduated from that uh, in the same company. I got promoted a few times uh, till I was the head of the auto uh, division, um, and then I felt like it was time to settle down and, and basically start a family. I decided to move uh, back to Canada, uh, where I uh, uh, settled down and started a family. Uh, the thing is, uh, life has its own plans, and in two thousand and five. Uh, I started my, uh, well, it's now called a startup, but back then it was called a dot com. Uh, and that was my first venture into uh, tech. Um, my startup was a food restaurant, uh, sorry, restaurant delivery service, pretty much uh, similar to your Uber Eats uh, or your Deliveroo available today. But I did this in 2005. Uh, and the first version was a, a website with uh, PDF menus because this was obviously before smartphones and apps. Uh, that business did uh, very well. We scaled uh, and I bootstrapped the entire thing because I didn't realize at the time that raising money was an option. Um, so there were a lot of business gaps and a lot of information that I didn't have at the time. I, I struggled, saw it through uh, and grew the business uh, uh, until I sold it in 2010. Uh, to a company that had just come into Canada and they discovered that we had non-competes with uh, a lot of the restaurants in the area that they wanted to operate. Uh, so they made a purchase offer, which was uh, good enough for the five years of work that I had put into it. I sold it uh, and then came back to Nigeria where I spent the next decade um, basically running uh, businesses in the real sector. Uh, these are manufacturing businesses. Uh, we started off a couple of... Uh, new ventures 
uh, and kept growing those businesses as well. Uh, then around uh, 2000, uh, I think about two, two years ago, uh, we decided to sell those operations uh, and I decided to move on. Actually, my, the business had decided to sell the, the business operations and I decided to move on. Uh, and then the question was, how do I apply these skill sets uh, in the current context? And because I believe in the tech uh, segment in Nigeria and I see it as a rapidly growing and evolving space, I decided that I was going to take my real life experience uh, uh, of running businesses in Nigeria, which are very specific uh, problem sets, and apply them to my tech knowledge of uh, how I got my startup up and running and take a mix of that and apply it in the tech uh, segment over here in Africa. So that pretty much brings me to my journey up till now, and that's what I'm currently doing. All right. So inspiring. So Anil, can you please provide an overview of the current state of AI adoption in the businesses and industries? Um, so it's it's interesting um, uh, because there was a uh, report by Equinix uh, uh, that was looking for the 2023 Global Tech Trend Survey, uh, and they uh, they interviewed over 2,900 IT decision makers in 25 countries, um, including Nigeria. And the, the the most interesting part for that particular survey for me was that they found out that uh, almost 90% of Nigerian businesses have plans to integrate AI. Uh, into their business, which is higher than the uh, global average of 84%. Um, uh, the, the report also concluded that it found out that um, Nigerian businesses are most likely to use AI for customer service, that's about 75%, and about 63% of them were going to use it for fraud detection. Uh, uh, these are more than the uh, uh, global averages for which they, they are going to be adopted for. Uh, so the, the report basically attributes the high adoption of AI uh, in Nigeria to a number of factors, but the primary uh, reason is the country's young and tech-savvy population. Uh, it's growing economy and the uh, availability to, uh, to these technologies today. All right. So Anil, uh, what are some of the key benefits that businesses can gain uh, from implementing AI technologies in their operations and the CN making processes? Uh, so the ultimate goal uh, we all hope is to basically increase human efficiency, right? We, we all want to be able to 10x or 100x our capacities uh, and the ability to apply it uh, uh, apply AI in the context that it stands today is purely limited by our imaginations, uh, I, so, or so I feel. Um, I have seen tech, uh, this tech, that is AI specifically being applied to uh, reduction of cost, uh, you know, uh, the ability to improve decision making, uh, new product development, fraud uh, prevention. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, definitely, there, there are a lot of uh, benefits and as we continue to explore them, uh, we would be finding out the limits of, of how much this can be applied across. All right. You rightly shared that AI adoption is often seen as a way to improve efficiency and productivity. Right. But the, uh, can you please share specific examples of how AI has achieved uh, this in real world business scenarios? Can you share like, you know, some use cases or some case studies on this? Oh, absolutely. So, so let me talk to you from a global perspective because the adoption is still, uh, you know, at a very infantile stage in, in, in Africa. But from a, a global perspective, um, I mentioned uh, the, the reduction of cost. So there was this article uh, that highlighted uh, Walmart um, uh, as a global chain and it's using AI to optimize its inventory uh, so that the holding cost of uh, of materials that they have to keep on their stock uh, shelves is is lower. Uh, that's that's a brilliant use case for uh, the the reduction of cost uh, in improved uh, decision making. Uh, the the example that comes to mind is, um, um, and I'm sure you would have probably heard this like at least five times uh, in every conversation that you've had about AI. Uh, the AI CEO. Uh, of uh, of Dragon Websoft, um, uh, Tang Yu, if I'm not mistaken, is the name. Uh, 
uh, and uh, who was appointed as the AI CEO of this uh, gaming company. And for the period of time that uh, she was performing as a CEO and making uh, analytical decisions, uh, she actually outperformed the uh, the Hang Seng uh, Index, uh, which is the stock ex uh, exchange index of uh, uh, of Hong Kong. So that that is a case study for you know improved decision making um, for new product development. If, if, in June, uh, this was one of the first uh, uh, cases that I'm aware of that uh, Incilio Medicine began clinical trials uh, on a drug that was completely developed by AI. Uh, and again, for fraud uh, prevention, uh, there are a few case studies in, in Nigeria that, uh, that are trying to adapt this. But really, the one that stands out that has the most amount of brand recognition is JP Morgan Chase. Uh, they use uh, AI to detect fraud and improve their risk uh, management processes. Uh, can you listen me? Hello? Hi, Zaid. Did I lose you? Yeah, I think there was some problem in network, but um, yeah, let's resume the con. Okay. All right. Uh, did you get that last answer or do you want me to, uh, yeah, to take I another think, shot at uh, it? Let's, let's yeah, I think let's repeat that answer so that we don't miss. Uh, as you okay. told that it is you AI is used majorly for improving efficiency and productivity. But you were mm -hmm. use you are sharing some kind of you know uh, use cases and case studies, successful use cases. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, I was mentioning that I would like to use the case studies that are. Uh, based internationally because Africa is still in the very early stages of adopting this tech, uh, the technology. Uh, so I mentioned the re uh, reduction of cost. Um, the case study that comes to mind is Walmart. Uh, Walmart very effectively uses it uh, to optimize their inventory so that their holding cost on, on uh, stock items is, is lower. Um, on improved decision making, uh, uh, the, the thing that comes to mind uh, is um, uh, Dragon Websoft. Uh, it's a uh, gaming company based out of Hong Kong that at some point last year, if I'm not mistaken, decided to install uh, Tang Yu, uh, which is an AI CEO at the helm of their company. Uh, and for the period that they monitored the progress, uh, Tang Yu, the, the, the AI CEO, outperformed uh, the, the Hang Sheng Index, which is the, the stock exchange uh, index of Hong Kong. Uh, so that just shows that there is a case study for improved decision making uh, when the CEO is available 24 hours a day uh, uh, in real time and can review data as it comes in and make uh, uh, dispassionate uh, decisions. Um, in June this year, when we're talking about new product development, uh, Incilio Medicine uh, began clinical trials on a first fully generated AI drug to reach human clinical trials. Uh, this is for a lung disease. Uh, this is the first time in, in history that that has happened. And uh, one of the things that is happening very frequently in, uh, in Africa uh, is that uh, AI is being used uh, 
for fraud uh, detection and prevention, uh, which is basically a page of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's uh, book about because they pioneered uh, using AI to detect fraud and improve their risk management processes. Super cool. So Anil, what are some common barriers or uh, challenges that businesses face when trying to adopt AI? And how can they overcome these obstacles? Uh, primarily, uh, it is the lack of awareness, at least in our context over here in, uh, in Africa. Uh, many businesses are not yet completely aware of the benefits of AI or how it can be used to improve their operations. Um, followed by the second very, very closely uh, is the lack of skills. Uh, you have uh, the technology, but you don't have the people that can, uh, can, su can successfully deploy these solutions uh, and make them uh, work. Uh, uh, people feel like the, the cost may be a, a problem. Uh, and lastly, which, which I find to be true in, in my work in the space, is the quality of data is also seeming, uh, seemingly a, a challenge because up until now, uh, we didn't have the drive to, uh, to structure our data and keep it in a way that uh, would, uh, would be prepared for, uh, for uh, uh, AI. Um, now, the way that they can overcome these obstacles uh, is that uh, companies need to rely on, on local partners that are conversant or more proficient in solving these, uh, these issues. Uh, for example, you know, you, you want access to email, you don't start up your own uh, uh, data service uh, center, <laughs> you, you sign up for Gmail. Uh, so it would, it would uh, be best for these companies to work uh, with, uh, with a local partner. Uh, for instance, there's this company that uh, in Nigeria uh, that, that's called Analytics Intelligence, uh, and they offer a PLLM service, which is, uh, for lack of better words, imagine chat GPT, but in this case, the chat GPT is a expert in all things relevant to your company based on your data in a uh, secure environment. Um, and you can present it, uh, complex uh, questions uh, based on your company's performance, and it provides you a solution right there and then. So you would work with a partner like that, for instance. Uh, you would educate your, yourself and your team about AI. Uh, and more importantly, I think you, you need to start small. And you know, once you're convinced of uh, the application and you're convinced of how it works, then you can now put, uh, you know, presume to scale it. All right. So Anil, you know, data is often considered the lifeblood of AI. How important is data quality and availability for successful AI adoption? And what can businesses do to ensure that they have the right data? Uh, so the old uh, adage for computer sciences, or basically even when we were, uh, when I was a kid at least, I would hear in this concept of garbage in and garbage out. Uh, I think that that is ex especially true uh, for AI right now, uh, because we don't want a situation where the information is presented uh, and is not reliable or accurate. Uh, you know, hallucinations is a, is a big thing uh, already that uh, some companies are facing with, uh, uh, with the integration of chat GPT and, and things like that. <clears throat> now, while work is being done on resolving that, uh, we have to ensure that if you're running your own data on the system, that the quality of the data is, uh, is, is collected, organized, cleaned, uh, and applicable to the use uh, case in which you want to uh, deploy them. Uh, also, I think very important uh, to start with would be to kind of have the, the conversation about what data needs are there. Uh, people say AI and they just assume that some magical solution is going to fall uh, and make their lives easy. But what it actually is, is a study of really, really large uh, data and it has to be structured and it has to be trained. So the first question would be what kind of information am I hoping to get uh, from my uh, data? So once you've identified those needs, then you would do the collection, the cleaning of the data, you know, removing the errors, the inconsistency, the, the repetitive data. Um, and uh, then it would be to monitor and ensure that you're constantly updating the data and training your models to learn that uh, uh, that new updated data so that you are constantly 
uh, at the cutting edge of uh, the information that your company requires. All right. So Anil, how do you see the role of AI evolving in enhancing customer experiences and engagement of the business? And specifically, how businesses and startups can use AI to make their customers' experiences more, you know, better? So th this is a brilliant question. And I actually think that a lot of the, um, uh, the uh, businesses eventually are going to ultimately adopt to uh, AI for, for, for customer experiences. Um, so here are a few of the thoughts that I've had on this uh, subject. I, I, I think personalization uh, is going to become a big thing. So uh, the customer's experience uh, from a um, uh, from a customer's point of view, from their POV, is going to be very personalized. Uh, when I call a bank or when I call uh, an e-commerce uh, uh, customer service line, the service is going to be, it's not going to be generic. It's going to be based specifically on my profile, uh, my, my use case. Uh, if there is um, any uh, pending orders, for example, in the e-com, uh, it would refer to that, that I, are you calling with regards to your last order, which was just delivered two days ago? Uh, but proactive customer service would be the second factor, which is where we don't have to connect with the service. The service will basically reach out to us when it anticipates that there's going to be a problem. Like again, in case of e-commerce or in case of delivery, there's a delay. It, it uh, reaches out and informs that this could be uh, happening. And of course, real-time engagement, right. uh, which so, which is. What industries or sectors do you think are poised to benefit the most from AI adoption in the near future? And why? I mean, you know, there are a lot of industries, a lot of businesses, a lot of verticals. But what top five or top three uh, businesses or sectors you think would be, you know, taking a lot of benefit with adoption of the AI? So for me personally, if you ask me, my consideration is always with the lens of Africa uh, and AI uh, that is applicable over here. Uh, I hope. Uh, that's that's a better way to put it. I hope it addresses things like, uh, you know, food insecurity, healthcare, uh, education, and financial services. So I'm hoping that that is the impact it has, like on uh, on ed tech, on on health tech. Um, that's pretty much my my hope and expectation for for what sectors it can have the most impact on in Africa. All right, you caught my interest by using the terminology ad tech because ad tech is my favorite area. So okay. when we talk on education technology or education or learning or teaching or whatever, uh, how do you see uh, the future of education and learning with the adoption of AI? I mean, you know, my specific question is, will it will, I mean, how do you see the future of education like in sense of the education model? Uh, you know, there is already a model called on-campus model. There is a model online model and there is a hybrid model. And where you see the role of AI in all these, you know, educational stuff. Uh, and so why AI I, in education? So I, I come from a time where it was basically on campus. Uh, and uh, now with the, uh, you know, with COVID and stuff, I, I got to see my son struggle with, um, uh, with online. Uh, and I understand the distinction between the two. Uh, the distinction really comes down to the ability to answer your questions or your concerns in real time as they happen. Uh, which was very difficult in a online uh, uh, situation. Uh, so this is why, I don't know if you've had the chance, but there's a very interesting TED Talk uh, by the founder of Khan Academy uh, that, that released a few months back. Um, and uh, they have deployed a, a solution that basically all their classes are still online. Uh, but there is an AI component where you can have one-on-one -on -one tutoring based with uh, with the with the AI, specifically with the challenges that you're facing. So you can raise a question that I don't understand this. Can you please explain this again? Uh, and while the course continues, the AI engages you and kind of takes 
uh, the time to explain it to you in multiple different ways until you have gotten that point. Now, because the low cost of barrier in this model, this and of course the, the smartphone penetration in Africa, I'm convinced that in the next, uh, or, or, or rather I'm really, really hoping that over the next you know, decade, uh, that this would become the mainstream uh, way that we can communicate uh, effective education across Africa because uh, the cost uh, for online schools don't necessarily work. Uh, the offline of online uh, classes model does not work without the, the support. But as AI gets more engaging, uh, you know, uh, smartphones are available everywhere. Data is actually quite cheap over here. And I would imagine that the the these two things coming together would, would work uh, uh, for EdTech in, in Africa. All right. Uh, we listen a term very often, ethical AI. What ethical AI and explain the significance of AI ethics and responsible AI adoption in businesses. What steps can businesses take to ensure ethical AI uh, use? Uh, so from my perspective, uh, it, it comes down to simply maybe one or two action points. Uh, number one is that if we are using AI in our business models, um, whether it is to store or uh, to use information from uh, customers or to run data analytics, uh, we should rightfully probably, uh, you know, inform our customers uh, that we are collecting uh, this data and we're using it in a responsible manner after we obtain their consent uh, and protecting the privacy and settings. I think that's that's paramount. Basically, we should have uh, the transparency that AI is being used and that this is the, the purpose uh, we're using it for. Um, having said that, I don't think that AI uh, is... Um, uh, is here to replace human judgment. I, I think it's here to augment it, is to help us make better decisions. Uh, and as such, no business should completely outsource the responsibility, at least for now, uh, to, to AI to make the decisions, but to present the case uh, and present the information and then the human uh, behind the AI can make the decision. All right. Anil, you know, small businesses and startups have very limited budgets or almost no budgets. So AI projects can be resource intensive. How can small and medium sized enterprises uh, with small and limited budgets and resources can leverage AI to their advantages? Uh, well, as is with any technology, I, I definitely believe that this is going to get cheaper over uh, time. Uh, anytime there's a new tech in the market, uh, the cost, the initial cost is always high. But as time goes on, it always leans towards becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, so that that's one of the things that is going to happen. And it's, it's going to get rapidly accelerated with, with AI just because of the virtue of the product itself. Uh, but for companies, uh, I said this earlier, I'm going to say it again, uh, start with the pi pilot project. Uh, don't be over ambitious. Uh, you know, don't commit uh, uh, your large financial resources to a project. Start small, measure your results, uh, you know, whatever your parameters are and say, okay, this is what we expect. Uh, don't be afraid to experiment. And, and once you have the result of that in a sandbox environment where you have uh, uh, tested and you are certain that it works, you know, in the in the in the right uh, manner. Then you can now say, okay, go ahead and and make the investment choices from that point on to scale the the the, uh, the, the solution. All right, uh, Anil, you know that all the game is of excuse me, all the game is of data. So when we see, you know, Europe has a very comprehensive data privacy law called, I guess, GDRP. So when we see the data privacy and, uh, you know, this is very critical a topic. And when we see, you know, protecting the sensitive data and ensuring that AI systems are secure, how do you see the role of government and uh, in, in view of the policy? And how do you see the role of the big tech corporations? How the data could be, you know, really, really in safe hands? 
so, so this is an incredibly complex uh, question, I, I feel, uh, because uh, look at the quality of the data uh, or look at the, the access that large companies, for example, Facebook, uh, Meta now, or Google uh, have on, uh, on people. Uh, and we were not concerned, or maybe we were concerned, but not to the, to the point where we are now implementing these, uh, these changes. It's only because now we have AI and we can imagine the, uh, the rapid acceleration of use of those data models that didn't make sense earlier. So uh, unfortunately, I think that this is a question that is better posed to policymakers that are much smarter than I am. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, we all have a, a, um, a responsibility to ensure that we manage our data or we keep our personal data uh, you know, out of the, the hands of, of companies uh, that uh, are not um, uh, uh, transparent about their application or the use of, uh, of how that data is going to be. So this goes to my earlier question, that, uh, or, or, the, or your earlier question, sorry, that uh, how do we hold companies responsible? Well, they need to have the transparency that we're using your data, and then we can now, as users, make the decisions ourselves whether or not those data uh, uh, should be shared or not. All right. So, uh, Anil, you know, I am really, really enjoying this conversation because this is really, really insightful. And since you have a two decades of experience, that's huge. And I guess um, our conversation will be so, so uh, beneficial for all the you know new entrepreneurs uh, who are thinking to adopt AI for their businesses. So keeping in view, Anil, what advice do you have for business leaders and decision makers who are considering AI adoption but are hesitant due to perceived barriers or uncertainties? Um, you have to start. If you don't start, you're going to get left behind. Uh, AI is here now. Unfortunately, you know the, the genie's out of the bottle, so to speak. Uh, there is no way that this is not going to impact every aspect of human life uh, over the next, uh, you know, five to ten years uh, significantly. So it's 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 important that we understand that we have that limitation. Start small. Uh, start with you know data and for uh, your infrastructure. Partner with an AI expert because not everybody is completely familiar with what is happening in in the space. Um, educate yourself uh, and and your your team. There are companies out there that actually provide trainings to CEOs um, uh, and middle management so that they understand the impact of AI on their businesses. Um, like I mentioned, I mean uh, there are other companies uh, that do that. Uh, this is this is the kind of resource that you want to tap into uh, and and get off the ground. But the time for this is now. Uh, if you don't do it in a few years, you'll realize that it's been. It's, uh, you know, everybody else has leapfrogged and gone ahead and, and you're left behind. You spoke very beautiful, you know, I would say very, very powerful line that start. Why? Have to. Because yes. it, it has happened now. Fortunately or unfortunately, it has happened and you cannot reverse it. You have mm -hmm. to adopt it. I 100% agree. Uh, Anil, this would be the last question of our podcast, but it's very, very interesting and the most important question. You know, right now, if we see the internet, social media, everywhere, AI, 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 AI. I was listening a uh, brief of uh, the Google CEO, Sundar Pichai, and uh, somebody made a clip, um, a very short clip, where he was, he said... He used this word many, many times, AI, generative AI, AI, generative AI. So when we see AI evolution, there are a lot of AI tools, thousands of AI tools. Every day, many, many, a lot of AI tools are being rolled out and launched. The question is, you know, human capital is the central point. Awareness, education, training and skills there when we see 
the training education and awareness level and skill level there is a huge gap in the market the question is how the humanity in general and specifically the business and startups and the employees how everybody can benefit from the ai by getting education on it training on it i mean how to bridge the skills gap the knowledge gap the awareness gap what is the way out because you know what the schools colleges and universities unfortunately in general in 200 countries maybe just there are five or 10 countries where the education system is so good that they are sinking students with this ai stuff but 90% of the schools and educational institutes they are not training their students on this what is happening in the market so how to bridge the skills gap so uh, uh, again from an african context uh, a lot of this responsibility unfortunately falls on um, uh, you know either the private sector or the public sector the, the, uh, nigeria fortunately has a very forward thinking uh, minister of tech uh, he's come up with a new um, um, uh, agenda that he would like to train 3 million uh, nigerian youths in tech uh, over the next 4 years uh, it's it's a very ambitious project uh, but he's made his intention clear uh, he has put uh, certain mechanisms in in place um, and there are companies that are basically uh, adapting to uh, to that so the private solution is coming uh in hand in hands with the public solution to try and find ways to uh, to bridge this gap because ultimately like you correctly said um i don't think uh, with with the exception of a few countries in the world people are still trying to figure out how best to learn this how to adapt to this how to uh exploit or explore it uh and as the tech is changing so fast i mean we've already heard about the uh chat gpt sam altman so um, presentation i think about a week ago uh where he further changed the business model and this is going to continue to happen uh as as uh progress does the 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 growth rate is going to be accelerated a lot of companies are going to keep coming up with new ai products that are going to change fundamentally the way that we choose to exist uh and it's going to become a a responsibility for all of us to be constantly updating ourselves uh in these uh in these matters um unfortunately there is no one funnel right now that says okay fine if we uh, you know go on this website and we're constantly reading about it that we'd be updated uh right now it's uh, you know it's a, it's a collaborative effort from uh, you know the the minds of uh, like the mckinsey global institute has a great uh uh article that they put out every now and then uh, that's my go to uh, the MIT tech review is is a fantastic uh, place to uh, to read about what is else is happening in tech um the ai section of of tech crunch the online magazine uh but other than that uh, we uh, youtube is is a great resource uh, your podcast <laughs> is informing people of exactly that so it's it's a collaborative effort of everybody coming together and trying to find solutions to you know uh, hopefully people will pick up something from somewhere uh something from what i said and pick it up and and educate themselves on it but uh, i think we're still a few years away from having one streamlined solution for saying okay this is what you need to study to be a expert in uh, in ai right uh, anil thank you so much for joining and it was really really super amazing and insightful episode uh, with you so since uh, my the audience of this podcast is you know university students teachers startup entrepreneurs and uh, you know a lot of business community and many many maybe the scientists too so what advice would you like to give to all of them any inspiring message anything you would like to share with the audience uh pretty much uh, what uh, i told you before we started recording is that um uh what i told sam altman when i had the opportunity to meet him uh when he had come to nigeria uh is that uh for better or worse that the world has now changed uh it has changed forever and we cannot go back to the way that we were 
Um, I'm an eternal optimist, so I believe the world is going to be better off. Uh, and I believe that AI is going to be a part of being able to take us to that next uh, level. So it's here. We should adapt to it as quickly as possible. We should learn from it as quickly as possible. Uh, and there are opportunities being created every single day in this space. And before uh, uh, the search was a thing, Google became this trillion dollar behemoth because of that. Those opportunities are being presented again today in the AI space. We should take advantage of whatever opportunities come our way.